In this episode of Investors and Operators, we sit down with Walt Fries. Walt has run iconic values-led brands like Ben & Jerry's, Celestial Seasonings, and Stony Farm. As CEO of Ben & Jerry's, he transformed the company from a low-growth, marginally profitable U.S. ice cream business to the fastest growing global brand in the category. And there is a lot more to his story. Today, we're going to be talking about how to transform companies, leadership, culture, and just general advice for having an awesome life. So buckle up and let's rock and roll. Walt, it is awesome to have you here. And my first question is- Great to be here, everybody, you, Jordan. What, what is your second favorite flavor of ice cream? Ooh, okay, that's one I don't get asked. That second favorite. Um, uh, I would say half-baked. There we go. And, yeah. uh, I won't ask what your favorite is and I won't ask what your least favorite is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let me, is there one that you killed off? Is there a particular ice cream flavor that, you know what? That one's got to go. I will have, you know, in my first year as CEO of Ben and Jerry's, I managed to discontinue my wife's and my daughter's two favorite flavors to which my right. wife said this is a great response she said either you don't love me or you don't have half the responsibility you pretend to because <laughs> one of those is true <laughs> and you're like family listen sample size of two i'm sorry i gotta listen to the numbers <laughs> like you know, all right we were losing money on every pint well, let's, um, let's kind of dive into a question uh, that we discussed about a year ago when we did a fireside chat with transitioning veterans. And I know that's a cause that you and I care a lot about, put a ton of hours into, and it really gives us a lot of fulfillment. Um, it came up when you're discussing just the best available athlete model. So what does that mean? Well, you, so often when people are recruiting for positions in business, they tend to look at for precision, somebody with precisely the right background, the right numbers of years in position that came up through the right track and brought them here today. And they just happen to be a perfect fit because they've done virtually everything required for this job already. That's one school of thought. It's not one I particularly, uh, uh, subscribe subscribe to let me say that again subscribe to <laughs> uh, so what i learned over time was this and i learned through experience it was give me the best available athlete and by that i mean give me somebody who is bright who is driven who is team oriented who has a great and infectious attitude and they can learn just about anything, but finding those qualities in an individual assures not just that they're going to be able to do that first job, but that they're going to be an asset to the company longer term. Does, does that apply to only junior positions where you, where the junior skills can be trained up, whether it's in finance or consumer oriented brands or Unilever, or does that also apply to mid-level and senior positions? I think it can, it can apply to mid and senior level positions. And I've applied it there before. So, and in fact, it's not uncommon at, for in large corporations, for somebody to be, uh, let's say in a manufacturing role, taken out of sales at a senior level, VP of sales, given an assignment in marketing, given an assignment in finance or HR to groom them for the future. To prove it's the same way. Yes, they have the support structure around them, but they're going to grow into those positions and be a better all around manager as a, uh, as a result. So I think it can work for uh, mid and senior level managers, you want more of an experience base. So in terms of experience having led or experience having managed, that can be critically important. But by the same token, whether it's experience um, having specifically been a uh, VP of marketing before, not necessarily. 
when you're coming into a new company, you know, when you came into these leadership roles, first, can you set up the context into which you came and then discuss how did you start to reorganize? How did you start to reorient? How did you start to really transform the business? I've done this in large corporate roles. I've done it in startups. I've done it in PE backed businesses. Uh, I can also share from my perspective as having been a uh, PE operating partner. So you know, I've looked at it from a lot of different angles, but one thing that I learned to do um, over 20 years ago now at, at this point, when I came into an organization was to take the time to really get the culture and understand what I'm starting with and where we want to go. Now, when I say where we want to go, it sort of underscores maybe one of the first points that I'll, I'll make is don't give culture short shrift in terms of going for the quick understanding. You know, we t we'll tend to do that a lot in, hey, finance or operations. You know, help me understand uh, gross margin. Help me understand efficiencies. Help me understand product raw material costs. Well, culture is a little more nuanced, but to understand it first, don't just talk to your direct reports if you're an incoming CEO or a private equity firm. Get a sense from the people that make up the business because for it to work, it's got to operate and have impact at every level of the business. And what you may come to find, and this happens very often, is that there's a culture that most people would agree defines the business as a social system. Um, and you really can't divorce that from the economic system either because the two are really intertwined. As a banker, part of what I would do when we're selling companies is to put together, you know, the 50 to 75 page deck, you know, the, the SIM and you send that to buyers, right? And it's interesting. And when you're doing diligence on a business to prospective buyers, it's so... Uh, transactional and clinical in terms of, you know, show me the finances, show me, you know, this part about inventory and a lot of questions related to that. But I, I don't, it's interesting that so little of the process highlights team and culture. It's more on numbers and metrics, you know, the products, the product mix, the revenue, the sales of that, the margins of that, as opposed to like, how do you convey the culture that they are buying, the team, not just the management, like all the way down. How do you convey that? So true. When you consider the fact, I look at it now and I consider the financial part, which I used to focus on too, as the easy part compared to the culture part. But I will tell you, having been on the operating end of, from both multinationals and startups and PE back companies, is that more um, roll-ups um, fail as a result of culture than fail as a result of, we just got the numbers wrong. You know, so often it's something that people just don't take the time to understand. And if cultures are incompatible, something's gonna give on one end or the other. And whichever side gives, you're going to see a proportionate decrease in the motivation, the aspiration, the engagement of the employees. And then you're going to wonder what happened to the business. How did you assess this in the early months uh, with Stonyfield, Ben and Jerry's or Celestial Seasonings? I mean, is there a framework? Is there a process that you had to really say, okay, here's where we're starting from? Yeah, it's you. First of all, and I devoted about six months of this at, at Ben and Jerry's um, was taking the time to understand what defines the culture, you know, through the eyes of, I mean, both senior leadership, mid management, you know, entry level positions across the company. 
and get a really strong feel and then even better if you've got the if, and if you're an operator you, you usually have the time unless the house is on fire you take the time to really ask people to define the culture in words and there are a number of different um, a number of different approaches that you can use to do this but it might be everything that starts out as something as generic or typical as the positioning of the business and brand or what people believe about our company from the outside and can get at its heart after about a dozen steps right down to what is the essence of our business? Uh, and you get into things like, what are our values? You know, what is the informal you know, culture of communication? A uh, whole bunch of different things. But the more time you can spend understanding and then really putting words around that, the more you're going to understand what rung on the ladder you're starting on and how it compares to the organization you intend to integrate it with if you do can can we talk about engagement you know you, it's easy to see when someone on the team or the whole team is just firing on all cylinders and it, it's it's almost as if time does not exist because they're so into the flow of what they are doing. And you can just feel that with the team. How, how have you found to develop a, a highly engaged culture? I think it's really important to tie back your culture to your values, but also your metrics. Uh, so for example, uh, just at Ben and Jerry's for instance, Ben and Jerry's was unique in having a, a social and environmental mission, a three-part mission statement. Um, but we didn't just leave that in terms of motherhood and apple pie and alleluia. You know, what, we, what we did was say, we want you to select something that you can do in your own lives, in your own role in this business that will help to express and advance the social mission. So we called it social mission for short. Um, and an example of that might be, some people would say, uh, this was around the time of Hurricane Katrina. Like, I want to raise, a, you know, get a group together within the company and go down and volunteer to Katrina to sort of tear down and rebuild homes. Um, somebody might say, I'd like to get something started at my church and I'm going to take these steps to make it happen. And in each case, there needed to be something, a, you know, a clear, definable, uh, objective with metrics around it. Like how many homes do you want to really tackle in New Orleans? How many people, um, What's the goal of the program at the church? What's the impact? How much money do you intend to? I mean, it would be that kind of thing. So we really put teeth into it. And it was one very tangible way to see people put into action what we were talking about at a very sort of organizational level, but all sometimes didn't feel as personal. Yeah, it's... Um... And it's interesting to see how you're, you know, discussing that for a large business and how we're wrestling with the exact same thing as a six person business. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have discovered and, and, and are now implementing is, you know, why values and principles matter because it's the essence of who we are. You know, part of our core principles is authenticity. And that is throughout our LinkedIn posts 
that we do for clients are brand videos or portfolio company videos. If we're shooting a video on site and it feels like it's corporate BS, we will say this feels like boring corporate BS. And that goes back to our principles. And that's interesting because it's making me think the, you know, the reason why it's important is that as the organization scales, you can't be there for every single part of every single project, but you can have a shared vision. So everyone knows this is how we do what we do and what makes us hopefully unique. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, th I think so too, Jordan. So if, when you reach a point where you as an organization, you're in a conference room, you're making a decision, you know, it's great what things you may say matter to you in terms of your values, but unless you, your team, and eventually everybody in the organization are applying those values in meetings, expressing them, making them topics of conversation with how they relate to a decision, it doesn't feel authentic. Mm. You know, it's when you make hard decisions sometimes that it becomes most apparent what your values truly are. How do you reposition a company or a brand? What are, what are some of these enduring principles for any company and any industry at any size and shape? What have you found, you know, 20 plus years into your senior leadership at companies to be these kind of foundational principles for not necessarily starting a business, but for maybe turning around a business. One is, and this is the easy part of positioning, but so often, um, especially in earlier stage companies, they'll tend to forget it. You know, one is getting down the basics of what positioning is, is to understand, have you defined your target market or markets? You know, and that, so often I'm, I'm amazed by the fact that what people don't understand about a target market or markets is it is meant to be exclusionary at times. In other words, this is where you can get the best, the most efficient bang for your buck. It's not who is everybody that might conceivably buy a product or service. It really is who are the people that are most likely to um, adopt and continue as loyal customers of that product or service. That's where you get the financial return. So that, that's, it's, it's just, that's a basic blocking and tackling type of thing. But so often I'll see, especially startups, um, get the target market piece wrong. And as a result, they may struggle with, um, they, they may struggle with really driving the kind of efficiencies they need to. On their well, I think it's, it's equally applicable to the buyout scenario in an industrial manufacturer or a healthcare products Ooh. business or a consumer products business, because, you know, whether you are a startup and figuring stuff out or you're buying a business that's been around for 20, 30, 50 years, it, it's, it seems like it could be such a healthy discussion to go rigorously into that questioning of who is your true granular customer and why is that? Is that real? It, we've been doing this for 20 years, but is that how we should be doing it going forward? And, mm -hmm. and that like that deeper analysis um, and, and, and just understanding every part of your demo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, 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 more specific you could be without going to the, you know, head of a pin is the better off you'll be. So it needs to be something that's actionable in terms of your ability to invest, but you know, but it's gotta be something that's going to drive ROI as well and drive your messaging, your communication to them, everything else. Uh, the, the second thing is just being really clear about what business you're in. You know, what's, I'll call a competitive frame of reference, but you know, many of us in business school will remember the, um, the example of the railroads, you know, the railroads at the time in the United States that the 
you know, internal combustion engine came on the scene, were enormous in the U.S. And of course, they defined themselves as being in the railroad business. Well, that was, that was absolutely uh, the trap they fell into when they didn't pivot to anticipate that there was also going to be you know, a big piece of the supply chain that was going to start moving via the internal combustion engine. So, you know, that little difference of, are we in the railroad business or are we in the transportation business was, you know, fundamentally changed that industry. Have you, have you found that companies which are more mature face the similar um, lack of strategic thought? Or have you they, found that? Yeah, I think they can. Because I don't want to project my own day-to-day -day focus on tactics, just as the nature of being a small business, three years old, you know. But what have you found for companies that are are more mature? I think if you don't get these aspects of positioning right and question them over time and come back to them, they will come back to bite you. So you need to constantly, as the economy evolves, as society evolves, you know, as technology evolves you really be looking at, okay, now what business are we in? You know, I mean, you just saw this this week, uh, you know, people may hate or love uh, Facebook, but you know, all over the news was they're talking about a name change. Yeah. You know, and of course it's like at one, you know, in one sense, it's what a convenient time, but at the other, on the in the other sense, it's also, Mark Zuckerberg and Cheryl Sandberg and the team there saying, hey, do you know what? We used to be that social media business, you know, on a, you know, on a certain platform, but now we're moving into this metaverse that's going to mean we're, go we're going to need to become and pivot and become a company that's far broader in its capabilities. And so we're going to name it Meta, as it turns out. Um, but, you know, things like that are critically important, not because the, you know, a name chain necessarily matters, but because of the, you know, that underlying business model pivot that sometimes it can illustrate. Once you get that point of difference, you there are two other things that I'd really stress. One is very textbook. One is really make sure that you are filling an important unmet consumer and customer need. It's, it's not enough to make sure that it's, you know, um, fulfilling a need. You have to make sure it's an important need that's not being satisfied by the companies or brands in the space that day. So that's a really big one. Um, now, <laughs> the, the second thing, and the reason I particularly wanted to come back to this is now that I've told you everything I believe about positioning, I'll go one level deeper that I graduated to over time which is by the time I became CEO of Ben and Jerry's, I would not allow people to use the word positioning in the building. We just stopped talking about it. And why is that? Because while those tips I gave are really useful to a business just starting out, at the end of the day, if it comes across as positioning, um, you aren't being authentic. You aren't being true to yourselves. So at the end of the day, what was really authentic about Ben and Jerry's, the brand, was that it was absolutely an extension of the people who walked through those front doors every day. It was that clear who we were, you know, what we were and what we weren't. And so one test of authenticity for us was, okay, is this something we would do? Is this something we would say? Is this something we would advocate for? 
And if the answer was no, that's all we needed to know. And you talked about this earlier, and I think it's really important to, to, to emphasize it, is you need to be, you need to surround yourself that with people that will challenge you around those things. You, you need to have these discussions and none of us gets it right all of the time. So especially in a senior role, if you're a CEO, thank God if somebody comes up to you and tells you the truth you don't want to hear. That is the best thing that can happen to you in your job and hope it happens every day because that means you've developed a culture where people feel empowered to bring their best thinking and they realize that you don't believe that because you're in the most senior role that you've somehow got a monopoly on great ideas. There's nothing further from the truth. I, I think that is a call to action for anybody who is watching and listening to this, asking your team, senior, mid-level, junior, everyone, just finding a good enough sample set of what is the truth that I don't want to hear, but I need to hear. And if you create a culture through team dialogue, like really open team dialogues, you know, company, really open company dialogues where that can start to happen, you've created magic. And those are the kinds of cultures that change entire industries. I love that. Hey, did, did that evolve for you? Or like, did, did you have a, what's a piece of, uh, what is something maybe that you heard that was, you didn't want to hear, but maybe you knew, or that you didn't know and you didn't want to hear, but you realize in retrospect, that was exactly what I needed. Okay, so this was when I was at a level of heading up uh, marketing initially at Ben and Jerry's. We came in and this was immediately um, following an acquisition, but we, we came in and the CEO at the time said, we need to have an, a, a, you know, across the board, 10% uh, cut in, in headcount dollars, you know, and we need to do it in the next three months. And I want each one of you to come back with me on my leadership, to come back to me on my leadership team and tell me who's going. So I, that was a gut wrenching process for me. You know, it really was a tough one because this wasn't about individual performance any longer where there were shared understandings and agreements. This was about, an, you know, I believe an arbitrary decision that said, we're going to be a stronger business if we can reduce our overhead dollars by this much. Uh, and I went through that process. We went ahead and in very respectful individual meetings, you know, let people know who um, weren't going to be on the team going forward. And uh, then once that was done, we needed to have a meeting with uh, my entire team and talk about the changes that had taken place. Now, we had been together for probably about six months at this point. But people had learned that they could, uh, they could challenge me. They could, that I was willing to hear the tough news. So when I talked to them about the changes that had taken place, there's one person, uh, I remember who, Peter, Peter Nolan who stood up and said, Walt, he said, I really wish that you had told us up front what the challenge was. Because he said, we might have had some good ideas too. And there are certain insights we might have been able to offer that might have helped in the decision-making. 
And I thought about that at first. I thought that, that would be like a radical level of transparency. You know, not just that, I would have had to have also accepted that some of those people were going to have a few weeks of being very much on edge because they know something's coming down, but a decision hasn't been made yet. And yet I realized afterward, after listening to Peter and saying, Peter, I really want to think about that and digest it because I wasn't prepared with a response on the part. But I said, I really want to thank you for what you just said. So it's really going to give me something to think about. And I came back about a week later and said to everybody, I want to own the fact that I could have handled this better that I could have been a bit more inclusive about the process. I could have solicited more input and I might have made a better decision. And I believe I would have. I don't think it would have changed it night and day, but there were a couple of critical decisions I made, just two people, but I remember them to this day, you know, who I let go um, and only realized, you know, over the course of a year, I made a mistake. And Peter Nolan was one of them. You know, the other one was some, and I wasn't able to get him back. He accepted a role in Chicago. And a, another person, there was a second person named Sean Greenwood. Sean, I was able to get back to Ben and Jerry's. But it's like, to this day, all these years later, I remember the two individuals, the conversation, you name it. It left that big a mark. Yeah, and, and that brings up a, that one of the takeaways or many takeaways for me on that is, is asking the team, for example, like what's the biggest challenge we face and how can we work together to get through this? Because sometimes like Jing and I, who run our six person business, we're pretty transparent about basically everything, finances, sales that are coming in, et cetera. Um, but to that point on challenges, you know, asking the team, what do you see as the biggest challenge that we are facing right now? Even though things are going really well, um, but being proactive about asking about challenges and like, how can we work through this? Um, but also I think it's the interesting takeaway from that is, you know, that it sounds like that scenario presumed there were no other options that the team couldn't have thought about creatively. And another part of it is it, it makes them have agency in whatever is happening, which helps if it goes down the path of, you know, having to separate, at least there's some agency and they could be part of that as opposed to the, the um, feeling, feeling helpless. Right. They were heard. And that's the big difference. Did they feel heard? Mm. I think you're absolutely right. The other thing that I've learned is you can give people agency, even in larger organizational settings. So at Ben and Jerry's, you know, at, at um, our headquarters location, which we call central support, uh, but at Ben and Jerry's, we would get, we had a big room, sort of auditorium style room, and we could get over a hundred chairs in there. And we would routinely meet as a group. And there were times that they'd be more informational meetings. Let me share with you what's going on strategically in terms of results. And there's always time for, for questions and, you know, in those meetings and discussion, but we build into those meetings, breakout sessions of typically about six to 10 people. They go into separate meeting rooms and they would address whatever the big strategic question was of that day you know and it might be you know let me give you an example um how do we create a better sense of connection between ben and jerry's employees and our consumers that might be just one and every every four weeks, it would be another strategic question. And what that does is it gives them an opportunity to have input, but it also takes into account that people are both introverts and extroverts. So introverts will tend not to share a lot in big public meetings, but if they do it in a small group, you're going to get their input. They're going to feel heard, but they're not going to feel on the spot. 
and then allow each team to present. We got more, first of all, we got a ton of great ideas. But then more than that, by the time a year was over, most of the key aspects of strategy you know, had been discussed and everybody had had an opportunity to weigh in on it. Yeah, I, oh, I love that. And it's, um, it's really making me think about this difficulty around finding time to be holistic and finding time to be strategic when we're very focused on the day-to-day -day tactics. And I'd like to say that it's a challenge of being a small business, you know, not finding that time to block out Friday morning or Friday afternoon to think about that. But I'm assuming that people of larger businesses have the same issue where it's not like, you know, like, hey, well, your CEO of Ben and Jerry's and 90% of your time is to think in a chair and to be strategic and to have these fingers you know, in the steeple and just think strategically. <laughs> but it, you're, you're dealing with the day-to-day -day tactics as well. Um, like, how did you find, um, how did you work in that time to be holistic with managing the business? How did you balance that? Well, over time, I realized that um, what I was doing wasn't, even though I believed it deeply, in that sense, it was altruistic. It wasn't, uh, it was also selfish. Let me put it this way. It's the fact is by doing these things, we became a consistently better business. I can guarantee you, we were able to like double the size of the business within a seven you know, seven year period, we were able to take it from this, you know, business that was just squeaking by in terms of profitability and wasn't growing in terms of sales, in terms of the fastest growing brand, you know, ice cream brand globally. And you know, the with the best operating profit margin. Uh, so we did that because we made those changes, not in spite of it. So some people look at this and say, oh, it's the softer side of the business. Come and ask everybody how they think or feel. You know, it's like, hell no. If you can get a high level of engagement from those people, and if you are over time through your reputation as a business and brand, able to attract incredible employees and retain them, your business is going to outperform the market. It's, you know, what I used to call it just this, virtuous circle you have to do it for the right reasons but when you do it you get paid in spades so but in terms of the more mechanistic like what specifically did i do i didn't want to have to wing it and remember to do these things so we built them into standing meetings if there was a quarterly all hands meeting well then it would be at the quarterly meeting if there was a, you know, once a month, I'd have, uh, I'd buy pizza for everybody and we'd sit down and this time it was open to whoever wanted to attend and the agenda was no longer my agenda or our leadership team agenda. It was the agenda of everybody else in the room. So what did you want to express opinions about? What did you want to ask questions about? What do you want to propose ideas about? That was the topic of that meeting. I, I love this. It's, it's making me want to do a series of short interviews, call it like less than five minutes where I interview, call it 10 to 20 operators at different PE firms. Just ask them, how do you assess culture? How do you work on culture? What's the real priority of that when you're working with your five portfolio companies from the beginning, middle, or towards the exit? Because uh, I, I think it'd be a super fascinating topic to see how they do it. Right. And too often in my experience, it doesn't happen. You know, there's no assessment of, of culture or time spent really understanding that culture, even though it can be absolutely critical to the success of a business. 
and I would not have believed it when I was in business school, but I came to sort of live and breathe that Peter Drucker quote that, you know, culture eats strategy for lunch. You know, it's just the truth. I don't care how brilliant your strategy is. If you don't have a motivated team behind you to make it real, it's just a nice presentation. You've, you've had this pretty interesting career and most would consider it very successful uh, within the consumer product space. And if you're going to write a book, what would be the title of the book? Oh, wow. Finding culture one scoop at a time? No, it would be more probably something like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. You know, it's just been one, you know, I've always talked about it in terms of my next adventure. You know, and I've looked at it in terms of that, that road. So it was just a series of unfolding chapters. I'm not one of those people that can say, oh, I knew when I was in the fifth grade, I wanted to like run a business or run Ben and Jerry's one day. It's, no, I probably would have been happy to run any ice cream business in the fifth grade, but you know, but that wasn't it. It was a series of things that I aspired to do, learning, integrating, and and sort of digesting that, and then thinking about what was next. So, what is your next adventure? Oh man, there are a whole host of them for um, for me, but I think. The biggest thing right now is in my life is coming back to uh, my spirituality right now. And it's sort of, what am I on this planet for? What can I do to make myself a better version of myself and in this world? Um, And that's a constant way for me to grow. So I've been meditating on and off since I was 17. I've gotten away from that. I'm getting back into my meditation practice. And I find that brings incredible clarity to me. You know, so it's a, a lot of internal work, but by the same token, you know, I'm still motivated to serve. So, you know, serving the veterans community is still a really big deal for me being able to uh, sit on a couple of boards. But th the only time I do that is when I'm also in an advisory role with the CEO. And, and fortunately for me, I'm able to like specialize in um, young sort of values led CEOs. You know, and that's a really fulfilling thing for me to do too, to give back that way. I love that. Have, have you found throughout your career where there was a trade-off between the work that you were doing and serving others in community and where, you know, there may, may have been, did you find balance or was it imbalanced? You know, and I'm asking that because, you know, we're growing our business. It's, we barely have time with, you know, two-year-old and a five-year-old to, to you know, just do the stuff with the family, much less think about community. And so, you know, we've had to really, we're figuring out how to balance the business, the family, our nonprofit work with veterans and pursuing our, you know, our endurance goals. Um, but I don't wanna be like, oh, I'm gonna give back to the community when I'm over 55 and I have, and I'm part of the Trace Comas Club and I can have a foundation right. and you know, then I'll give. Right, right. You know how, you know, maybe that you, you've thought about that and how that's evolved for you. I, I have throughout my life and there have been different answers at, at different times. So at, you know, coming out of business school, I was very much focused on, uh, on, career and on business and I was single and that was easy to do and I enjoyed it. But over time I felt too that, well, gee, this whole 
service and giving back to the community, that, that fellow man, what that piece wasn't fulfilled. So I started thinking about what kinds of businesses would really fuel that for me. And you know, in my way, I integrated it by saying, okay, well, if I could do values led business, which was still a you know, relatively uh, new thing at that point. I mean, companies like Ben and Jerry's body shop were just getting started. It reminds me of uh, one of the other vlogs we've done with um, someone named Jay Jester at Plexus Capital. I was like, what, you know, can you talk about how you think about community impact? He's like, he's like, I don't, not to say this, but like my day-to-day -day job in growing small businesses and helping them do big things, like I, that's literally part of my mission. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I get my community impact by helping out that small business through our company. And it, it didn't really hit home for me until we started to see what we were doing in forming quality relationships in the content we are doing. Or this one person got on the Forbes 50 over 50 because of the vlog inspired her to speak more openly. And then we started to realize like, oh, like we can create more meaning and be impactful you know, we don't have to have a foundation around that or nonprofit. We have to have that, but you can still be values led. You can still be impactful and do that in business. No question about it. No, and I think there's a, you know, it, and in fact, it's harder to do. You know, some people will think of, you know, values led business as the softer side of business. No, it's just the opposite. You have to do everything a normal business does and more, hold yourself to a higher standard, not less. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Well, and, 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 and so I think the call to action for me and for hopefully others who are listening to this is taking time to see, are you service oriented? Do you have a mission? Do you have uh, a mission to the business that is impactful? And in finding a way to maybe discover that it can be impactful. It is absolutely fantastic to have you on here. Jordan, and always good to be with you. forward to a, a part two. <laughs>